Great, people are joining in fast and furious. Good morning, what a beautiful day. This is actually our third talk focused on uncovering inequities in the design community and to bring ideas to this much needed dialogue. From the words of former First Lady Michelle Obama, sums it up certainly for us. Let's invite one another in. Maybe then we can fear less, make less assumptions, and let go of the biases and stereotypes that divide us. From our previous discussions, we've uncovered a number of opportunities to initiate change. For example, at our last talk, we had a deeper dialogue on future opportunities, and today we are here with a lens on education. We know there's a lot of attention currently in the education system, faculty de dedicating much time and energy to similar discussions, working with student groups to identify systemic issues, and form working committees dedicated to, long to the long-term improvement. For us at TIDC, we're asking ourselves, how can we collectively in the industry be a resource for the education system and support your expedited change? I'm Daryl Ann Coles, your co-host today, along with Nadine Kalenga, our designer services host here at the center. Deep thanks to our panelists joining us. We applaud you for being here. There's such strength in sharing your stories, your voice and your perspectives. And we really appreciate your time and energy. And to our guests as well, thank you for joining us, for being open to hearing others' perspectives, to listen, learn, and pose your own questions. With that, over to you, Nadine, to make our introductions. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> um, at TIDC, we're committed to helping make change and to take action in the, action, in the design industry. We see our role as a conduit between various industry groups um, to bring diverse views from our community and to support where our support is needed and to lead initiatives where it makes most sense. Uh, what will entail exactly going forward is, is starting to form. On August 11th, we are hosting a workshop dedicated to next steps. Here, uh, here we'll meet with panelists from our talks and representatives from Beta and other groups. Our goal is to prioritize, plan, and initiate where we can make the most impact collectively. For now, let's get started and introduce our panel today. We have four emerging designers, um, an educator, and one of our showroom business owners with us. First, we have the dynamic duo of Francis and Bell Studio. Uh, meet Jamelia Francis and Michelle Bellissimo. After going through school together and becoming good friends at Humber, they shared similar disappointing work experiences and decided to take a leap of faith and form a business partnership. From this, the name Francis and Bell Studio was born, where they bring contemporary skills to create a company built on their values of creativity, quality, and authenticity. Jamelia, who was with us for our first talk, was instrumental in us um, forming this discussion. First stepping to the design world as a consultant at a luxury furniture retail boutique, she then moved into a small residential build company. There she learned what it was like to run a growing business where she wore many hats from construction project coordinator, marketing assistant, designer, and client affairs coordinator. Michelle first accumulated skills in the residential design field, working from a large home builder. Later, she entered the commercial side where she exclusively worked in office, on office, hospitality, and healthcare projects. This allowed her to acquire key knowledge while managing the logistics and deadlines for large projects. Through dedication and consistent high performance, Michelle was able to build an extensive network and portfolio. Next, we have Gabrielle. Gabrielle Boateng is a uh, Ghanaian born. She's Canadian raised and a Ryerson interior designer graduate. She finds herself called to explore and transform spaces from the inside out. Driven by design that not only inspires but informs, Gabrielle believes design is a tool that can be used to express one's true self and create spaces that speak to, encourage, and satisfy the wellness of your industry. Gabrielle has worked in various projects around the world at Core Architects, Samora, Samora Architectural Design, 2x4 Design, and is currently an intermediate designer at Design Theory here in Toronto. We also have Catherine Lawrence, who connected with us through Arito. 
Born and raised in Kingston, Jamaica, Catherine moved to Canada in 2015 to pursue her interior design degree at Sheridan College. She then joined the Perkins and Will team, who decided to pursue design stem from her need to explore an avenue that would allow her to embrace her love for the visual arts and her fascination with how the built environment shapes and influences society. Her ultimate, her ultimate hope is to use design to improve lives and to help pave the way for other emerging designers. We also invited Anne-Marie Armstrong to give us her perspective from the educator side. She is an architect, a co-founder, and a principal of the architecture and design practice and studio, and a lecturer at uh, University of Toronto's Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and Design. She's also a founding member of BETA, the Black Architecture and Interior Designers, Designers Asso Association, where she focuses on mentorship and education. Prior to founding AMP Studio, Anne Marie gained extensive professional experience on a range of notable projects at Gary Partners, Marmol Red Designer, and Bester Architecture in LA. Anne Marie holds a master's in architecture from Yale University, where she studied a Fulbright Scholarship and an honors bachelor of architectural studies from the University, university of Waterloo. Wow. Welcome, everyone, and thank you, Nadine. Uh, and from our center, we have uh, Jacqueline Manji, who is president of Ultralux Linens. She's with us to share her inspiration later for an exciting initiative she is forming to support design students in their education endeavors. Jacqueline, who has been a mainstay at the center since 2012, has over 20 years' experience as an interior decorator, kitchen designer, and manufacturer. She also spent six years teaching in the residential design program and developed a program outline for the interior design degree at the Art Institute of Toronto and is a former board member of CDECA, now DBA. She and her team work with designers at the resource offering expert advice in sourcing fabrics, wall coverings, hardware, and more. With her fantastic team, she also manufactures her own bedding collection and creates custom drapery and linens in her latest endeavor with an on-site workroom at TIDC. Very special. So, welcome everyone. <laughs> what a lineup we have this morning. Let's get started with our Q&A. For our audience, we'd love to hear from you too. This is meant to be a discussion. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know what your interest is. And if you have questions, please pose them in the question function in Zoom. We have five areas for our discussion today, one being the path to design pre-post-secondary school, biases in the education system, faculty representation, diversity in curriculum, and student support. All of these stemmed really from some of our initial talks and in chatting one-on-one -on -one with our panelists as well. So the first question I'll throw out there to those of our panelists that would like to share is really tell us about your experience and support relative to um, today and when you were young, in particular secondary school or even pre-secondary, what barriers you experienced in wanting to pursue your chosen career or perhaps of your peers, things you noticed and any ideas you have to share that would improve this experience really why we're here. Anybody want to volunteer to go first? All right, Gabrielle. Oh, I thought you had your hand up, Gabrielle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll go, I'll go. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm very honored to be here and even in discussion with everybody here. So uh, this is ground breaking work and I just do really want to say that so um, yeah I think you know being Ghanaian born and coming to Canada I was very young I was four years old when I moved here so like wide-eyed and kind of just taking everything in so when I came you know we started in school and all that stuff and my mom was very adamant about having me and my sister in Catholic school so Interestingly enough, growing up in a Catholic school um, from like JK to grade eight 
was very interesting because there are morals, there are kind of standards that people have to uphold being in a Catholic school. There is a level of, of dignity that you do have to treat everybody with. And obviously, you know, if you're going to claim a, a religious background, you adhere to it. So truthfully, I, in elementary school growing up, I didn't necessarily feel as though maybe I was too young to understand anything, but um, I think I was, I was love and respect and care and um, understanding, maybe even more so because maybe they, my, my teachers at the time did know that as a black child, maybe I might have some, some things that come that may be a bit of a barrier. So in elementary school, I didn't necessarily find any issues, educators in my school. Um, so that was a really interesting thing for me to notice. And then when I went to high school, I did have black educators. They were English teachers, which I think was incredible for me because um, it meant that the language in which I was being able to use or try to express myself to a certain degree could be under like accepted as as curriculum or as something that people can learn from. Um, so I think the number one thing in 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 high school that I learned was like matters how you choose to use your voice matters and um, even in like writing the power of, of thought and and transferring thought and having people like understand thought coming from you know women who looked like me was a very powerful thing in university design I loved it like there was n there was really there wasn't really anything that I can say that and I think amongst me and all of my friends in the School of Interior Design, they'll know the school, love the curriculum, um, love the professors. I did not have any um, black professors, um, but it necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that it was a pr problem. Uh, um, however, I would be in groups with um, other classmates and I had an incident where I was in university and I was in a group for a project called Vertical Studio and with Vertical Studio it's three second years and three first years and they um, come together team together and do a project and present it um, at the end of the term um, so I was with two other um, white women and we had a presentation with the prof professor. They, um, we were told to stay with one certain part of our design and just develop other parts, but keep a certain part of it the same way. So all I did was remind that, remind them, like, remember, we're supposed to keep this the same way. Let's focus on another part. I think the issue that I found growing up and having, um, you know, wearing the skin and being in this industry is the the fact that oftentimes we don't necessarily feel like we have to be heard and, or I, yeah, we don't feel like we have to be heard and um, people feel like they don't have to listen to BIPOC people for whatever reason, because for whatever reason, they may assume or think that um, we don't have anything valuable to offer or valuable to say. And that was kind of, I don't know, it was a very, I know I was speaking in a normal voice tone. I know I wasn't being, you know, aggressive or anything. I was just kindly trying to remind them. The professor told us to this part, I think we should focus our energies on other areas. And nobody wanted to listen to me. Nobody wanted to hear me. So, come presentation day event and to change it. And in that moment, I genuinely had to physically step away from them because I just could not for the life of me understand why every single time I try to say, can we stick to this part? Because it's not even you, like the professor said, we should stick to this part. Um, nobody wanted to listen to me. So I brought it up and 
they said, next time, please speak louder so we can hear you. And I told them, I said it multiple times, and I said it in a way that I hope us, you know, clearly and effectively, I don't have to repeat myself, nor do I have to raise my voice in order to be heard. So I don't know where the um, misunderstanding comes when somebody is speaking, because when they speak the first time, I heard them clearly with no issue. But when I speak, there seems to be a problem. I have to stay and, and just accepting it. And I think it's a very, very common thing we see, you know, consistently throughout time, history, industries that I mean, ample coworkers or colleagues, um, these, the women that I worked with will now become interior designers in industry and carry that if they did learn from the, that time they'll carry that understanding of I don't have to listen to the certain people group I think that it, um, but you know I survived here I am <laughs> here you are and we really are happy you're here and you're able to talk now and we hear you we um, unfortunately you're cutting in and out a bit Gabrielle I hope we caught everything um, but if you have any ideas of now that you have gone through that experience and we've heard that from others as well, is there, you know, we'll talk later about ideas as well. Would anyone else like to share? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in uh, with some experiences. Um, I, I think, uh, Daryl, and you were looking at focusing sort of mostly on the earlier sort of secondary level, is that sort of elementary yeah. secondary at this yeah. stage? Uh, yeah, no, and, and then just again, thank you to the TIDC for including uh, me in this talk and, you know, having a chance to talk about beta as well. Uh, so very excited to be here. But to, to answer your question in terms of my experiences, and it sounds like, you know, in terms of what Gabrielle was talking about as well, that, um, for me, there was a real kind of palpable lack of representation in secondary school, um, uh, you know, from the perspective of who the teachers were, uh, you know, and, and what the, the curriculum was like, uh, you know, to be frank, the, you know, my, the teachers that I had throughout elementary and high school, I would say, you know, easily 90% were white. Um, and in the curriculum, you know, particularly as a student that was interested in the arts and loved visual arts, um, you know, I can, I can recall, especially in high school, you know, taking those art history lectures or being part of those lectures in art class, and there were slides, and each slide would be a European focus. We would be exposed, you know, and it was exciting, but it, and I, you know, at the time, I didn't really think about it. What we saw and what we were presented with was what's called the canon of art, which is to expose um, us to old and new masters, right? What are the, who are the masters in classical architecture and art, Renaissance, you know, and, and we're exposed to these things visually and, to, and, and implicitly kind of encouraged to value that work. Um, and that sets the stage for further education in, in, your, in, in, in subsequent uh, degrees, right? But I, I think ultimately the, the conversation, there were no conversations at that time, although I hear that that's sort of changing about what the history of oppression was that was enact, enacted by these cultures on others, who was silenced, what stories and histories were erased in the process. And how did that, that history of oppression support projects to build these monumental chapels and works of art and frescoes? So that, that context wasn't discussed and probably intentionally so to keep it kind of pure and sort of somehow great in and of itself, but it was certainly supported by histories of oppression. So I think that what I would look to, you know, in terms of Daryl and your question about, okay, so what what would you like to see happen? Well, I think that 
and hopefully that there are, you know, that the curriculum has changed since I was a student, because that was several years ago, you know, like late 90s, early 2000s, you know, secondary school, but that, who knows, but, but, the, but the hope would be that in classes now, in an art history class, for example, I would love to walk in and see conversations occur, where maybe the students are still being exposed to that work and the work of other diverse cultures, but then there's also this sort of uh, addition of a conversation around questioning the rules of greatness and having a kind of a critical perspective on that work, even at the level of a secondary school student, to be able to say, um, let's talk about issues related to gender, race, class, sexuality, and geography in and amongst conversations about the work so that we can talk more critically about it. And those can be simple discussions, but I think it, it opens up the stage for, again, uh, having a voice, like Gabrielle's talking about, where's the voice, and how can we talk about inclusive kind of education and, and understanding? Uh, so that, that would be uh, where I'd like to see change occur. That's great insight. Thank you, Anne-Marie. My pleasure. And Michelle or Catherine, anything else you'd like to add before we move on? I'd just like to chime in for a second, um, but I, I, I completely agree with you, Anne-Marie. Uh, my perspective of pre-second, well, post, my perspective of high school was, is a completely different lens because I came here in 2015 to study. So I grew up, my education was in Jamaica. And basically that idea of that holistic art, and I 100%, I, I know there's a question that's geared towards curriculum, like, I 100% believe that's so important. I think um, one thing that I do appreciate, and I don't know, I can't speak to, the, to that level in Canada, but one thing that I did appreciate about my schooling back home was that we had the ability, because the Caribbean is really a melting pot, pot as you know, and so by default, we ended up studying, like by understand, we, we were very pro understanding the region, and then by default, we had to branch out and understand European history because those were our colonizers. We had to understand Indian history. We had to understand the people who made us one and what their different characteristics were, you know, and that kind of thing. I think that kind of holistic approach is, it really allowed for a, 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 an appreciation and a kind of fairness to other, that, uh, to diversity and to other cultures. and. You know, I think that that's something that definitely can be, you know, brought to that level here. 100%. That's very interesting that that's happening in the Caribbean. Wow. Thank you. Anyone else before we move on? Um, I guess I could speak next. Uh, I kind of covered some of this stuff in the first talk I did. Um, but um, I guess talking about representation in regards to curriculum and staff and, you know, I've always been a kind of a creative person and I didn't know what I essentially wanted to do until I probably hit grade 11. And, you know, I was kind of scrambling to um, get together my portfolio and just learn as much as I could so that I could apply um, the next year to interior design. And in grade 12, I took a grade 11 art course because, you know, my guidance counselor told me that's what I had to do. And at the time, I never kind of realized, like, being in that history course and, and learning about the different types of, of history and, and, and art and just what the standard was, I never really paid attention to it because a lot of times we're just, it's what it's what we know and it's what we're taught as the standard and most oftentimes it's, it's eurocentric based and you don't really it kind of goes over everyone's head as okay this is just the way things are this is just what it is mm -hmm. so i think from from that point it was it didn't really occur to me and i just was doing what i had to do to you know qualify and then by the time i was in um college at humber it kind of started to, I started to open up my eyes a little bit more, um, being that I was one of the only minorities in the entire program at the school, you kind of start to look into yourself a little bit more, you're a little bit more self-aware, and there was almost no representation 
um, across the board in terms of staff and, you know, history courses, like talking about furniture um, history and design and just architectural history and design. There's no diversity at all. And by the time I got to second year, I was like almost 100% and fully aware of that. And it's, it's something that you you almost feel like indifferent to because you know that you can't you can't change and um i feel like we're in a time now where even if i was in school now it would be pre it's it's going to be really hard for people to go back to what it was because people are so hyper aware of the climate that we're in so i'm really interested to see how things are going to change because there's going to be a lot of pushback, not even just from Black people, but just from everybody wanting to diversify the curriculum and, and essentially knowing the truth and, you know, broadening our spectrum. And I think it's, things are going to have to change in order to to progress because there's, there's a super hyper awareness about what's going on and what the climate is. And I think people want change. And a lot of the times I found myself bored in high school because I knew the courses that I had to take in order to qualify, but it, it just felt like everything else is just fluff. So I think it's time for real change. And, and as you mentioned, um, Darren, to talk about, um, sorry, no, Emery, to talk about, you know, sexuality, um, women and diversity and all those type of things. We need to start to implement that into everything because everyone is tired and I think it's time for, for real change. So that's yeah, kind of my time, That's and, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jamalia. Can um, I ask something, Darlene? Um, one of the things that I keep hearing from uh, in these talks and in general is how um, uh, people from racialized communities often feel like they're the only ones that are in their circle, whether it's in uh, school or in a, industry event um, and there's there's got to be a reason why and that that's uh, I think partly because in racialized communities people don't see design education or even a career in design as being something viable or something that's practical or even something that is possible because it isn't um, it seems very um, lofty or it seems very unattainable as a lifestyle that you know, why would you pursue a career in a field that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, appeal to you as an end user, as a consumer? So um, that's one of the things that I think we need to we need to talk about when we address education and reaching out to uh, racialized communities where there's a very talented young people that are coming from uh, very diverse backgrounds um, that are not really attracted into design educations or into design fields because they simply don't see themselves represented across the industry whether it's in uh, academic or in the industry in general and I think that's something that we can tap into as well. You read my mind Jacqueline that's exactly what we we heard that um, in our previous one as well the there's the attraction but and then there's also the pull to to post-secondary as well. Yeah, we're hearing a lot about curriculum this morning already, but there's also can I, drawing people in. Yeah, can I say something? Sorry, um, just going off of Jacqueline's yeah. point because I think it's a very, very, um, extremely important thing that she brought up, and even for myself, like um, wanting to to do design. I in high school I took like specialist high school and major. Um, which is um, a major, like a high school major in business. So I was really kind of looking into business while I was doing um, arts to prepare for interior design. And um, I remember like, you know, when your parents ask you like, okay, so kind of what are you trying to move towards? I, I told my mom, you know, interior design. I told my dad interior design. My dad was cool. My mom was, you know, where is the money in that? Where is the path mm -hmm. in that? Blah, blah, blah. And all we had an example of was um, HGTV, like, you know, the standard kind of mm -hmm. house flippers. And it's interesting because, like, as I kind of looked at the people who, you know, were able to do certain things, it's, it's interesting to kind of see, like, every, every industry, every job is, is a service. We should assume that it's a service that we're doing for the whole of humanity or for the whole of society. And 
the industry of interior design, um, we have to ask the question, who are we serving with interior design? We would like to assume that we're serving the masses, but it's only a very particular type of people that are able to afford this service. So we have to also think about what is what makes it like hard for people to see themselves in these industries because of who they're serving. Like, I don't know. That's kind of yeah, that's actually a really interesting point, Gabrielle, that you bring up about who is design serving. And um, I just, I want to bring up a really brief, like very quickly, a very interesting um, example of uh, the Eurocentric approach to design and how it impacts communities in which people live. And uh, I guess some of you might be a little bit young to remember this, but in 2005, uh, Paris was literally on fire because um, neighborhoods in largely central, sorry, Northern African, Moroccan, Algerian communities were rioting against the buildings in which they were living in. So um, these were uh, communities that were colonized by the French and they speak the language and when they migrate or look for better opportunities, they seek out communities in which they speak the, the common language. So um, the French ghetto size um, these communities living in northern Paris. And uh, eventually, the, generations later, the kids that are now unemployed, they're in their early um, late teens, early 20s, are largely unemployed in Paris, and they start to um, rebel. And uh, there were quite a few interesting studies that were done um, tracing back the environment in which these people were living and uh, the buildings that they were living in. And, and they were all built and designed and built and largely celebrated by Le Corbu uh, Corbusier, who is a celebrated French um, designer and French architect. And um, we taught that in school as a uh, history of design. And Marie, you could probably attest to that as well, that we um, study his uh, work and we celebrate it for being radical and, and uh, cut, uh, cutting edge. But when you actually look at the societal impacts of, of the buildings that he built and the people that were living in it, which were largely um, racialized communities, um, it had profound effects on these people that were forced to live in these uh, environments. And that's not just happening in Paris, it's happening around the world where the Eurocentric approach to design, whether it's from classicism to you know, the modernist movement, is actually impacting how people live. And um, there's a lot of study that needs to be done on that. And that's, you know, that hits us at the highest level of academia. But it's also one of the reasons why people in those communities don't feel compelled to go into design because they're not necessarily living in beautifully designed um, environments. They're living in what is deemed by many of us to be institutional. And institutional has, uh, is rooted in, in many cases in racism. And um, from a design perspective, we need to start looking at that as a society and I, like living in Toronto, I think that we're actually quite um, fortunate in that our, our, our um, ghettos in places like Riverdale or in, um, uh, sorry, I'm not clear on the neighborhood, but those are, uh, neighborhoods are starting to got, come under uh, revamping and, and gentrification, but it's inclusive because it is including um, both uh, people across all uh, income spectrums, but um, the rest of society has a long way to go in terms of that kind of inclusive in design. So I just wanted to mention that, Gabriel, because it, you brought up a really important point about design for the masses and who are we really designing for. And it's not often people of color um, that are, are coming out of, uh, of poor and disadvantaged uh, communities. Yeah, good point. And as the interior design community, we can really make an impact on that, for sure. So I know um, a few of us have had a chance, you've had a chance to talk about post-secondary already. If, if there's anyone else, um, we really wanted to you know, understand what the biases are, the barriers or challenges you experience throughout, and what in your opinion could change to remove these barriers. We've talked a lot about curriculum. Um, I think what I've heard in some of our discussions previously was around uh, the grading systems, financial assistance and sponsor and scholarships as well. Anyone want to tackle that one? Any of those? And we'd love to hear from Michelle too, who, you know, you two formed your yeah, yeah, um, yeah. friendship and went through school together. 
Yeah, um, yeah. I know Michelle has, you know, had some thoughts there too. Yeah, like I can't really relate with anything to do with race, but I found that in school that I feel like faculty really help. They, they have like favoritism a lot, like certain people, mm -hmm. and maybe it's a certain look that they had, but I find a lot of the time um, other people's work would be on par you know, the same yeah. kind of group, but they would just they would get higher grades or they would get more time with the teacher more or more attention. Like you used to always have to book time slots with the teacher, like 15 minutes each, you know, sometimes uh, you you can tell like the teachers would give like, like all of their time mm -hmm. to certain individuals, their favorites. I find that a lot in creative kind of fields that the teach it's because I feel like design is subject subjective mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day. So it, it's tricky, right? Yeah. So I feel like it's, teachers tend to like start grading more if they like that person more you know what I mean mm -hmm. instead of actually seeing the work because everything is I think everyone's work is great in different ways yeah. so it kind of leads if that makes sense yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the, the issue with that is and Michelle and I had this conversation before it's like um oftentimes you know the students of color are the ones that go under the wayside so like Michelle and I both have personal experiences where you know, we we haven't been paid attention to. And, you know, it's hard for her. It was very much hard for her, but it's also very much hard for me because I'm not being paid attention to and I'm a person of color. But you so also have another barrier. You have, like exactly. That. So I have an additional layer of a barrier between what the issues that she has and that I have. Yeah. And, and all the time not being heard. And even amongst my own peers, sometimes raising, you know, awareness and being shut down. So, and I, uh, not between Michelle and I, because we've always been yeah. honest with each other from day one, but like amongst other peers, you know, raising awareness and like being shut down and saying, you know, has nothing to do with race. And oftentimes, as Michelle said, there's favoritism, but the ones that are being favored are never people of color. Yeah. So that is the real underlying issue there. It's like, yeah, there's favoritism, but somebody that looks like me will never be a favorite yeah that's true so that is that is the issue mm -hmm. yeah i would add to that uh, i think those are are really key points and um certainly i as a student and, and also as a as an educator in that environment um i can i can attest to those things occurring and i think the in general at least in the architecture in architecture schools, there tends to be a kind of um, a kind of a, a culture, let's say, institutional culture of exclusivity. I would mm -hmm. say, you know, there's always a sort of um, the critic looking at the work of the student and, and passing judgment, and mm -hmm. the, the sort of there's a little bit of a kind of a mystery to it that sort of, you know, it's a it's a thing that uh, I think. Uh, that in conversations, like very recent conversations about how to break, break that down, how to make uh, discussing design much more accessible to other people as well. You know, mm. we all often laugh about archi speak and architect architecture's writing, and it's very convoluted most of the time. It's, it's almost like you have to know these funny terms about massing or concept in order to really access it. And so again, we're mm. creating certain gates and barriers towards understanding design, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like plan trying. Yeah, so, so yeah. I think that there are, in and of itself, in the discipline of design, kind of barriers set up to create exclusivity and sort of, uh, you know, uh, to uh, people in the public and then also people that are maybe relatively new to discussing uh, design, and which creates barriers automatically. And then on top of that, Jamila, as you mentioned, uh, we just, there isn't the representation in the student body or faculty of racialized students, black students in particular. I mean, in my experience as a student, um, you know, an undergrad, you know, it was like maybe two black students in a class of even, and that was, those are classes of 60 plus per year. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then uh, in grad school, there were three, three black students in my group, but maybe some not in other years and some. So in some sense, the, the representation of the student body and just this feeling of representation and belonging in the, in the institution was a really difficult thing to manage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the invitation to talk about issues um, that others might not face and, and, and not knowing if you're going to be met with uh, uh, open ears 
uh, it definitely was uh, a hard thing to navigate. So I think the more that we are talking about it, I think particularly in this climate now and moving forward in the academic year, I'm excited at that opportunity to have these more often open discussions. Um, but I think ultimately too, if we look back at the secondary school questions earlier on, and then now the post-secondary questions, they're very much intimately tied together. Yeah. So those foundational understanding of design and art that you receive in secondary school gets reinforced again in post-secondary school. Uh, you know, the messages are very much the same. The sort of, like Jacqueline said, the sort of uh, the masters of architecture and design, Le Corbusier is central to that understanding, but we don't talk about that work, his work critically in terms of how it impacted the user. We don't really talk about the clients beyond the sort of art uh, gallerists and uh, wealthy uh, people that, that he hired, that, were, that hired him for their amazing villas. We don't talk about the, the clients and users that were in the housing projects that he uh, both developed and then that international style propagated across, uh, you know, various cities and regions without a kind of critical understanding for what was on the ground, right? Or a kind of desire for erasure again, right? Which again is a sort of a colonialist practice. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's all so intertwined. And so uh, I know that you know, there have been discussions right now, and particularly with Beta, the, our, our, our organization about how do you create a pipeline of access and mentorship and, and from both secondary school through to uh, post-secondary school, because they're so intertwined, right? Um, that there won't, we won't see change in the student body or faculty representation or representation in the profession until we deal with the issues related to secondary school and the access into those institutions. I think that those are, that's a really critical thing as well. Yes, and we also had a comment from uh, Tracy O'Brien, who's an uh, interior designer and part-time professor. She's suggesting the recording of this we send to uh, CIDA as their are uh, regulating for interior design curriculum and that individual schools are not responsible for their education. Um, they're, so I think that's uh, a great avenue as well for us to explore and working with data and um, how we can further support that. That's a huge undertaking. I know this came up at our last talk as, or when the first talk actually. And you know we had people on panelists saying, we can go out to schools, but you know, there's so many and how do we you know, need to enlist a lot of people to really engage in those communities and spend time mm. to make that difference at the pre post secondary level, as you say, Anne-Marie. Yeah, those are structural issues, mm. but I think it's still worth saying that, that that individual mentorship, I think maybe, you know, I, I've, I've been very lucky to have you know, in high school, I had a really great teacher who was a mentor to me. And I think that he, that he made a difference in the way I saw myself. You know, he taught kind of, uh, you know, I had sort of uh, public speaking skills and opportunities, through which I was also kind of reticent to do before. And I think that, the, you know, having that mentor could mean a, a huge difference for that one student. So even though we're talking about these structural issues, I don't think, you know, I would hope that, you know, especially at Vita, we talk about this, like we can't get bogged down by that in and of itself and stop us from reaching out. So I think that there's the, the, there are these scales of change, but that individual change is really essential as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. Yeah. Um, we also had interesting, someone um, also said a question for Catherine. Is there a resource that could be provided to directly reference these holistic approaches to art education, such as the name of a school or educational model, so that these references can be shown to educational institutions as an example to help reform art education here in Canada? If there's like, you mean pulling back from the high school education and how we approach it in the Caribbean? Yeah. I wouldn't say there's a current resource now, but there can most definitely be um, yeah. one put in place. I do know that 
and I mean, when I was thinking about the, this whole topic and thinking about my own international advisor, who was actually in charge of the Caribbean, I think if schools themselves are interested in really understanding or creating a pool of information from regions and pulling together that information. So it doesn't necessarily have to be your Jamaica specific or whatnot, but could be the West Indies, the Caribbean, these different areas. I know that my international advisor, Anita, she was in charge of the Caribbean. So she would tour the different countries. So she, so I know that international centers, I believe, well, at least I can speak for Sheridan, but I'm not sure how the other institutions divide it. But in collaboration with them and the, the connections that they have liaisoning with the schools and those centers that they can work together, we can work together to pool information. So hands down, that can be created. Unfortunately, there isn't a set template right now, but I'm sure that if we work together collectively, mm -hmm. we can pull that kind of information together and hand off to schools for curriculum development. I think that's a great idea. I'm sure there are others too globally that we could learn from. Yeah. Um, we also have a comment from Melissa Tossel regarding unequal favoritism in school students getting the most attention are never the people who may need it more, mm. people of color. Does anyone think having a bind mentorship program, being assigned a mentee mentor without knowing their color, et cetera, could be something to help boost students who need extra assistance breaking into the industry during school and after? Uh, she's a huge believer in mentorship, especially within her own company, but also in her design community and have a mixed bag of mentees, examples, people of color, uh, someone with accessibility issues, immigrants and white, and she's much happier helping someone who needs her help and advice that can make a huge difference. Um, she knows it's difficult to make happen as you need mentors to make it work, but as Anne-Marie points out, mentors make a huge difference. Maybe we can reach out to the organizations such as Arido and DDA, to encourage them to support mentorship in a more meaningful, structured way. Yeah. Can I speak on this? Mm -hmm. um, I am a product of a mentorship. Um, our final year of university at Ryerson, we had to team up with a mentor to help us with our thesis project. Um, uh, the person who made this comment saying a mixed bag of people who um, not knowing their race when being selected. I think this is a great idea if amongst this mentorship program, people are able to rotate mentors so that there is an ability for everyone to get a taste of everyone. And the reason I say this is because I, of course, had my mentor, he's a black man, and um, it was extremely necessary for me to have him because he was literally the only other black higher, you know, voice that I can, that I had access to in the School of Interior Design. Everybody else was, you know, non-BIPOC. So it was interesting to see how I, I was getting educated from every other type of person and the very thing that I needed to kind of understand myself and how I can operate in this world as a designer was the literally one other person of color who was older and had gone through the school of interior design i think it's necessary because at the end of the day i got my insight from him and i got my insight from everybody else but he's a person of color and i'm a person of color and we're exchanging information between each other but this happens all the time with black with, with people of color people of color being mentored by um you know caucasian people or or you know any other type of people group is necessary and and the mentee also needs to be confident enough to know that they can contribute to the understanding of the mentor because the mentor has to be able to help this person navigate life and the implicit biases that any person aside from a person of color is coming in with will be challenged when they're mentoring and and this needs to happen like these conversations need to happen so i think mentorship and, and mixing the bag is necessary um, if the rotation of everybody's voice and everybody who needs to experience 
each kind of individual background, history, um, ethnicity, whatever, so that people have a more a, like broader understanding of, of just people, period, not just one individual, but an entire people group and how to serve each person um, uniquely or just, you know, universally. So, yeah. That's wonderful. Yes, great, great uh, insight, Gabrielle. And I think that's definitely warranted. We've got some comments from our audience too, saying that's uh, a good way to approach it. Uh, we also have a comment from Leanne Tamaro, who's current chair of education for DDA Canada. Who said, she says that a, there is a mentorship program in place and she would love to discuss more ideas on how to make it more meaningful. And we know Arito does as well. So these are great avenues for us to explore and have at the table, perhaps at our next workshop. Um, Darlene, I wanted to add uh, something to the conversation about curriculum. Um, I think we're also, uh, like it's, a, it's an interesting perspective in that I think we're denying um, all design uh, professionals the benefit of um, knowing uh, design outside of the Eurocentric um, aesthetic. There's some beautiful textiles and architecture that's rooted in African uh, design. Uh, Nigeria, um, at one point, if I may still exist, had a wall, a wall that was um, uh, that could rival the wall of China, but not many people know that. And so I think that we're denying um, design uh, at large, design community at large, the benefit and uh, the beauty of knowing design outside of um, what we've always taught at the very sort of basic level of design, right up to the sort of the, the PhD level of learning. Um, in that beauty comes from uh, the European uh, sensibility. And that's unfortunate because the world is very rich and, um, and enriched and, and there's so much more that we can be teaching and learning and embracing uh, in design. And I think that that's something from an academic uh, perspective that we need to start looking at and perhaps uh, influencing schools to start looking at, uh, looking into bringing into their curriculum. Can I speak on this? Can I comment on that? Um, I think, yeah, you definitely bring up a huge, a hugely important point. Um, in like personally, for me currently, I'm doing my own research in you know African design, African design aesthetic, where their um, understanding of like foundational building and all of that stuff, where they get it from. And I think in my own research, it's it's almost. I have to use the word infuriating. I'm sorry, but it, it kind of a little bit is interesting how, you know, the, we learn a lot of things from, from Greek, Greek architecture. And Greeks learned a lot of what they knew from ancient Egypt and ancient Kemet. And we cut off at a certain point where, like, like the understanding of life, of life and civilization stems from. If we really understood that life and civilization came from, you know, Africa, came from the Nile Valley, came from a, a, a continent that is very just completely shove aside right now in terms of the broader world view, we would have a little bit more reverence. We would have a little bit more understanding and therefore be able to hear people, be able to hear their perspectives, not have favorites because we understand that if, if, if we're coming from here, here has something to offer. Like there's um, a phrase in, in my Ghanaian um, culture that's called um, Sankofa. And it's a, it's a symbology that I've seen all throughout North America. And it's interesting because what it actually means and symbolizes is it is not wrong to go back for what you have forgotten. And just that in and of itself is like a reminder that we do need to go back and what we have forgotten, the people that we have forgotten, the things that we conveniently, conveniently choose not to include in our educational systems, these things need to be remembered because we're only at a certain point in society because we refuse to look back farther than a certain point in the past. Mm -hmm. And the history will re repeat itself if we don't look at it critically, if we don't look at it for what it is, honestly and truthfully, and, and bring everybody who has formed our history into these conversations. We've forgotten so many people, 
so many, like, you know, why do we only learn about the Holocaust for a certain period of time? And, you know, the transatlantic slave, slave trade was, is, is like the smallest part of our textbooks. Like, it doesn't make sense to me because these are two equally, maybe, horrific events but one outweighs the other for whatever reason. So I think we really need to understand that like life is shared amongst all people and everybody's history is valuable and we need to, and we need to uh, uh, like appreciate it. And, um, and the last thing I wanna say is there's this understanding about African art or African education or whatever that it's incomplete or it's not refined. And um, the European, understanding brought refinement brought perfection brought a certain level of like elevation to the the rawness of what came out of africa and i wonder what was lost in that transformation i want to know what was lost in that taking it from raw to to refine because we lose a lot in that process and i think we need to go back to the raw in order to understand that maybe we didn't need to get rid of so much to be refined or to have things in our home that are beautiful. There are a lot of things that are beautiful without having to manipulate or, or whatever. So anyways. And, and we also need to change the conversation around what's in and what's out um, in uh, design, especially when you look at you know, trends and publicate like the shelter magazines that suddenly declare that, I mean, I was telling Daryl in the story that, you know, one of the shelter magazines declared that ECATs are out well, tell that to Central Asia and the generations of weavers that have been sustaining their communities based on these aesthetics that, you know, the North American or the Western communities embrace as a trend or as a moment, and then they declare it out of fashion. So um, that conversation also needs to change around what is, you know, what is good design and what is refined design, as Gabrielle was mentioning. And, you know, we see that in the textiles world all the time. I, I largely work with textiles in, uh, in my business. And, and it's always about, you know, the trends and what's current and what's in and what's out. And, you know, I, I'm tired of that conversation because that's not helpful to, you know, designers in general, not just, you know, designers from communities of color. It's, it's you know, we're hurting the design sensibility across the board because we all kind of follow in this herd mentality around what, what is considered trendy and, and that's or sustainable. That's yeah, and it's hurtful to communities that sustain themselves based on these uh, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. I could just add quickly to that, Daryl, and if we have time, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. I also have a question in the question box for you, Anne Marie. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you want? Do you want to go, go ahead? ahead. Okay. We'll, okay. We'll, okay. We'll, yeah, we have just, time. We'll... Okay, great. Yeah, I would just add to what Jacqueline and Gabriel are saying. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I, Jacqueline, I think you, you framed it really well that it's a lost opportunity. I think that that's a really nice way to shift the conversation to say that, hey, you're missing out on something here mm -hmm. and it is central and core to an understanding of design. Um, and I think also the other conversation that I've been having with students recently, which has been kind of interesting in, in a seminar I ran on borders, uh, but, but the conversation was about what, what's the power of design? What is our agency as designers to enact change? You know, that, that it's not just about following aesthetic trends and having that being dictated down to us and then we design to it, but how can we design for the future? And how can we actively understand our political agency as designers to change, to, to convey ideas and include new people and create accessibility to spaces. I think that, the, that that's a really important thing too as well, that as designers we should be much more active and aware of the impact of design and particularly in architecture, you know, architecture is really very much for the most part a tool for power typically, you know, buildings that represent and are, uh, you know, clients that are in power, right? So how do we then find our own agency within that. I think that those are really important conversations to have even beyond aesthetic conversations because they're all intertwined. Aesthetics and power and uh, politics are, are very much tied together. I wanted to add that. Absolutely. So a quick question. Um, Nadine, are you, 
Can you see the questions? My yeah. internet connection is unstable right now. So this question, um, Anne-Marie, you actually have two questions. Um, this is a, an anonymous attendee. Her question is, our school students are looking at ways to approach our school to open a dialogue about anti-racism and holding more explicit values of inclusive, um, inclusivity and diversity. From an educator's perspective, is there a best way to approach this type of discussion that would be more successful in motivating faculty rather than discouraging them? Although this is a, fun, um, a foundational issue, we hope to begin discussion and hope to make some change. However, we can within our school. We're worried about pushback, um, putting too much responsibility on our particular school and being taken as, being taken as sensitive or asking, them, asking for too much from them. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, in architecture school, I'm not sure if this school is interior design or design or architecture, but uh, I know, and, and this might be something that might be useful for the, the person who's asking the question. Um, you know, a number of architecture schools in the last few months, uh, students, student groups have uh, written uh, open letters to the faculty of their schools and deans in particular. So. Um, addressing these issues of systemic racism within the school, uh, within the profession, and, 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 you know, for the most part, sometimes demanding change, suggesting change. Um, and, and these, for the most part, uh, these letters have received uh, very positive and active responses. So uh, I could say, for example, with Daniel School of Architecture, uh, there have been already kind of uh, open conversations and discussions that have been made public um, about, about these issues in response to the letter uh, and that, that, that the Diversity and Equity Committee has sort of been recharged in, to a certain extent with um, now in, inclusion of students' voices as part of the processes of evaluating equity and diversity in the school. So I say that, 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 you know, the open letter might be a place to start to really get those ideas on paper and to address it to the dean. This is a, there's been precedent set for that. So I would say that that might be the, 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 the way to, to get in the door. And it's because it, there's already a lot of precedent. It might be the, the starting point. But it is, it is something where it, it's challenging because I think in the past, students just haven't felt that sense of, of comfort and, and having a safe space to talk about these issues. But overall, I've been seeing positive responses at this stage to, towards the issues that students have been raising and their concerns and experiences. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Mm. Perhaps we can share the link after. I know I found it very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you want to look for the letters, often they're posted um, online, so you can go to um, various school websites. I think they've been posting them online, so if you want examples of how the letters were framed. Um, and also uh, architecture newspapers of journals online have been, have been sharing those open letters as well, so they're publicly available. It might be really helpful to kind of understand that, how those issues were framed as well. Wonderful, thank you. Next. There's another question, right, Nadine? Yes, yeah, so the next question is from Alice Wang. She says, thank you everyone on this panel for your time and sharing your experiences. My name is Alice and I'm going into my third year at Rice and School of Interior Design. Being a part of our program student union this year, our goals are largely focused on creating conversations among the student body, as well as the faculty on ways to promote diversity and inclusion in all aspects of our curriculum and curriculum and organizations of events. My question is for everyone, but maybe more so for Emory. In what fundamental systemic changes could students or student bodies ask from faculty or the administration that would be immediately action actionable to start building more inclusive and diverse communities in fall of 2020, as well as how best we should, we should approach them coming from an educator's perspective in a way that would be respective as well as understanding of their position? Yeah, so, so I think that that, that question, that the, the second or the latter part of the question is really sort of addressed in, in my previous answer in the sense that the, the broader sort of systemic issues 
can be outlined and communicated, I think, as a starting point through that open letter uh, process because that seems to have received really great reception uh, or positive reception or immediate response from the faculty um, and the deans of, of these various schools. The, the immediate action, I think, is, 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 is harder for me to respond to in the sense that I, um, you know, as an educator, but, but that there's like a, there's sort of an institutional underpinning to this all that's very structural. So I think what we've been talking about or what I've been talking about with others is the possibility of creating short term, medium term and long term goals, goals that might extend beyond even our careers as architects or our lifetimes, right? How can we create, you know, we want to create structural change that takes up a really long time, but to acknowledge that and so to create short term goals and medium term goals to move forward towards that end. I think the, you know, uh, in terms of immediate change in the fall, it could be that, um, you know, uh, for example, professors are probably in the process of finalizing syllabi for their courses, mm -hmm. and maybe there's an opportunity to create open discussion related to the topics, the core topics that are taught as part of the accreditation process, but then to create space for discussion. I think that that might be one way to start immediately creating an open exchange and dialogue around issues related to design and systemic racism. Then you have, uh, you know, uh, faculty hiring, um, engagement with design critics, and invited guests and lecturers to the school. These are immediate things that can change that are small and not necessarily structural yet, but are working towards that because these things take time. So I think I think it's about really setting, you know, like, like in our, in my business, for example, my practice and studio, we have a goal, you know, of growing as a practice. And so we work on short term, long term and medium term goals to get to that point. We all need a plan. And I think that as institutions, we can also acknowledge that that plan needs to be in place and, and those plans need to be actionable and then held accountable to. So, so I think that, that that's all a process, but those would be my kind of recommendations for the short term in terms of uh, real kind of immediate ways that we can acknowledge what the time that we're in, acknowledge the students' needs uh, and voice and create space for that voice to be heard. Absolutely. Wow, we've covered a lot and it feels like we're just scratching the surface, but um, we are, I know, Anne-Marie, you have to, to go, but we really appreciate everyone's time. Jacqueline um, was going to share a little bit about, um, we, we had uncovered as well, of course, financial support is, is definitely needed. And um, Jacqueline was gonna talk a little bit about her inspiration and what she's uh, doing in the near future. Um, well, I, I have to give credit to uh, Jamila for uh, lighting this fire in me. Um, I was very impressed with um, her comments in our very first uh, TIBC talk around Black Lives Matter. And um, I, I thought about some of the, the things that I experienced um, as, a, as an educator and also as a student and a, as a woman of color. And um, it, uh, it started to uh, get me thinking about how to affect like Amory says, you have to start taking small steps to grow solutions to uh, start making uh, some changes. Sorry, it's saying my internet connection's unstable. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so it got me thinking about where we can start affecting some of this, uh, some of these issues that we're seeing in that uh, we're not seeing enough students of color, um, enough black students uh, entering into interior design education and and part of that is is going back to our early part of the conversation where they're just simply not attracted into the field because you know where are the opportunities where's the potential for a career um you know families saying you know where will you make money who's going to hire you i experienced that myself uh, entering the field 20 years ago so what i thought about doing um was uh starting a bursary as uh from my company uh from ultralux to support um, a student entering uh, into an interior design program or an interior decorating or residential design program that will help support them financially in a small but meaningful way so that they, you know, symbolically see that they're not alone. 
Um, I'm interested in working with high priority neighborhoods where, you know, you don't see a lot of people fall, um, going into um, post-secondary education or also into a design uh, field as being something that's a viable career option. So the idea was to start a small bursary that would support um, a student, whether it's in supplies, materials, textbooks. Um, I had a very initial conversation with Jamelia on how that could, uh, you know, help a student. And it's a simple, you know, donation of $500 to support the supplies, the box of supplies that they need to get started in their first year. So um, it started off with that idea that it's, um, you know, a small bursary uh, funded by my company. But the more I thought about it, the more opportunity I saw um, to build on it. And that could be, you know, like a multi-pronged approach where you have an advocacy component that goes out to speak to students in these high priority neighborhoods and get them engaged in what a design education looks like, what a design career looks like, and encourage those students, you know, right at the high school level, um, or even, you know, younger, at, you know, fostering that kind of creativity and critical thinking that will help them, you know, see themselves going into a career in the design world. Um, so there's the advocacy component, um, there's a financial component, there's a fundraising component where we could actually start fundraising to pot potentially pay for the entire tuition of, um, of a student from a high priority neighborhood. And um, that could be a really interesting way to get them into, you know, universities that support architecture programs where they're, you know, not necessarily receiving uh, scholarships or bursaries or any type of financial support to follow in those types of careers. And then um, the, the third component would be uh, developing a mentorship program, which we've uncovered in this call, um, that there's obviously a need for mentorship. Um, and it would be, um, you know, and, and I, this could be controversial, and it's not really, you know, my area of expertise, but uh, like mentorship, mentoring like. And Gabrielle, you touched a little bit on, on the effectiveness of your mentor, who is a, a person of color, a black man, who's, you know, got uh, all of life's experience to help you and he navigates through all of the different things that they encounter, that you encounter in your design career. And I think that that's something that we need to also think about in that have, you know, um, people of color mentor young people of color uh, in their careers, because we also don't want to fall into that trap of, of, um, of the white savior and that, you know, let me help the people that need it most. Well, that's not necessarily what we're looking for in mentorship. We want people who understand, you know, my design sensibility and my 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 struggles as a person of color. How do I help? How do you, how do you navigate me through that when you have not had that same life experience as me? So it would be people even on this panel who would become active mentors. Um, and I'm I'm very excited about the new generation of designers that are coming out of our schools and their ability to be able to you know take the hand of of a young person who's looking forward to a life of design and helping them navigate through uh, academics and also through some of the things that they'll encounter in the industry as they start getting involved in, in their design careers. So this was the, the idea that's sort of percolating. Um, what I've, I've done is I've reached out to some uh, people that I've met through uh, Daryl Lynn's efforts at bringing uh, these conversations to the forefront, Jamelia being one of them, Alicia Roche uh, is another one, that I've reached out to say that I need your, your input and I would love to, to establish a, an advisory committee of um, people that want to contribute some ideas and some energy to what this could possibly look like because it's much bigger than me as a, as a business owner or as a woman who's in the design industry. Uh, this is not just like a kernel of an idea. This is something that could have some real impact and some real meaning and um you know i need i need help and i need voices to come to the table and bring some ideas forward and um and so we've got a really interesting group of people that are interested in forming this uh, advisory committee and this uh, advisory committee or this advisory board could then become a board of directors and um i would love to see it you know as a uh, an entity that you know has life and legs and that's going to impact institutional um, organizations and education uh, educators across the spectrum of design 
and uh, possibly across North America. It's not just like a local thing that I'm thinking of. I like to dream big. <laughs> so I'm hoping that um, I can inspire some young uh, people um, on this panel and in these calls to um, help uh, form this, this idea and also um, contribute to what this scholarship could possibly look like. And maybe it's not just one student that we're helping uh, from, a, from a, um, a disadvantaged community, but maybe it's, you know, many students across Canada that we're helping. And it's uh, for all, you know, people that are, are in these high priority neighborhoods, uh, you know, Black, Indigenous and people of color um, can really benefit from having, you know, uh, people that have made it or that are, are in the field, then, you know, reaching out to them and saying, you know, here's my hand, let's bring you forward. Because like I say, there's a lot to be learned from these communities. And, you know, we're so enriched with such a wonderful, diverse culture in Canada that we really do, you know, have a lot to, to benefit by bringing these students forward. So that's the idea that we're working on right now. There's a lot of, um, you know, planning and thinking that I have to put together for this. But Daryl invited me on the call today to introduce the idea and to get people excited. Um, just like I got very excited from hearing the initial conversations from Jamila and, and sort of wanting to get, you know, into action and not just about talking and like, where do we go from here? So um, we've got a lot of work to do and I'm, I'm open to uh, anybody joining us to, to move this thing forward. Jacqueline, I do want to say like um, you making the effort and, and putting it out there to support students um, coming up in that in like in the industry like I worked 30 hours while on top of having a full course load in university and you know as Jamila said you know probably not being picked the favorite but still striving so hard to just be in that classroom and then being able to afford to be in that classroom is like to hear what you're doing you know if I was you know six seven years ago God only knows how much something like that would have really and truly made like the experience just a little bit more useful. So you saying that almost like it brought tears to my eyes and I flicked them away because I was like, you know, yeah, this is this is kind of it helps. It 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 like you know, if you have to work thirty hours a week and somebody's just saying here here's five hundred dollars to make it easier for you, it's like mm -hmm. the ease that it takes off of. Um, a BIPOC person's back is a world of a difference and and honestly truly like maybe a world of a difference that people may not even understand like how much of a difference that makes in a person's life so I commend you for doing that and um any way that I can help I hope I can. Thank you I I, I understand where you're coming from because I dropped out of fashion school in the 80s and had to come back to my design education 20 years later uh, because I couldn't afford to go to school and, and, you know, there was nobody there to support me. And I, you know, like you was working 30 hours a week, plus going to school, even as an adult, I did that. So yeah, to help a young person, it doesn't take much. I'm, I'm working hard in my company to build, you know, um, something. And I, I feel now's the time to start paying it forward and paying it back. And so I welcome you, Gabrielle, to join us in this, uh, in this venture and, and helping to affect some change along the way. I have a question um, for you, Jackie, um, as it pertains to the application of this program to students like myself coming in as international students. Um, well, as you know, like our fees are twice the amount typically. And um, again, to your point, Gabrielle, like, you know, you have some really talented designers who, you know, are kind of shot out of the system because they just can't afford to, to continue the program. So. Even if it's simple, even if it's a simple thing as a case study, because I came to Canada because there was no interior design degree, right? So, um, and again, the whole idea of feasibility and, you know, them pushing you to do STEM programs and that kind of thing. So even if it is that there is access to this information that we share with recruiters and with international mm -hmm. offices so that we can actually put forward, not just to North America, but branching off that design is viable. This is what we're trying to show you and people are willing to invest in this kind of career. Mm -hmm. That would be really amazing, you know, because like I remember I was sold on this interior design program that I, I mean, because they simply said that they have a co-op and that was like, that was like a huge selling point. So if, if you can offer some more flesh to that pitch, I think, or if you can know that, okay, you know, this is what we have. These are some examples of some, 
you know, black designers or designers who look like you or who are making it happen, take that chance kind of thing. Like, I feel that that would be a huge help with the recruitment process and add to that, those, those two layers that you're talking about, Anne-Marie, like of, you know, the next steps and a third layer of how we can further improve our recruitment process so that we can even more diversify what our classrooms look like that person we can have you know we can tap into different people who of different economic backgrounds and just different you know ethnicities and cultures and and add to the discussions that we have and make them more informed mm -hmm. so yes that Great also point, Catherine. thank you there's always that consideration and i do know the cost is unwieldy for sure so we do need to wrap it up. Um, our next steps are August 11, we're doing a workshop that will not be live, but it will be recorded. Out of that workshop is, this is our take action workshop, is our next step. We hope to get all the you know, diverse groups, the more uh, diversity we have in our own group, meaning even across um, sectors within the industry as well. I think the better and that's an advantage we can be a connector for that conversation um, we will absolutely workshop prioritize all of the topics including education and come up with some next steps so we thank everyone for being here Jacqueline thank you for your inspiration and what your work you're doing and to all of you our panelists and the people who have stayed on even past our noon time frame but we'll get together again in September and uh, share all of the actions and next steps. Please feel free to contact us at uh, exploretidc.com and we will you know, engage and get you involved if you're interested. And Daryl and Nadine, thank you so much for continuing the conversation. Thank oh, you. Very so welcome, much. our thank pleasure. You. Thank you. All right, have a great afternoon, everyone.